Welcome to Family Features, a podcast for anyone who wants to experience healthy relationships within their family. This is Dr. Corey Gilbert, and I'm honored to come alongside you to encourage, educate, and equip you as we focus on the different relationships that make us family. Let's get started and focus on today's feature. Welcome to the Family Features Podcast. My name is Dr. Corey Gilbert, and today we have a great conversation with Jim White, uh, author, coach, and founder of the Family Enrichment Academy. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Looking forward to it. Yes, I'm looking forward to hearing more about you and what you do and just how you're impacting the world. So I'm excited for our listeners to to get to know you a little bit. Um, So tell us a little bit about your story and uh, your family. And kind of and a lot of times people will know, how did I get here? You know, where I'm at right now. So, exactly. um, so I'll start, and, you know, I've spent the uh, last 40 years, it's hard to believe it's been 40 years, <laughs> but as a, uh, the first of all, as a student of both personal development, marriage and parenting, um, you know, I've always had an interest and in studied those topics, but more importantly, I've also spent those 40 years Um, living my life as a husband and a father to six children. And we actually have 12 grandchildren now. So taking those lessons and applying them um, over my life, uh, you know, as a father and a husband. Um, I like to, and I might kind of share, I like to think of myself or refer to the idea of a hero's two journeys. Um, And I know your audience may or may not be familiar with it. So I'll go ahead and give a little bit of background on what that, what that is. Um, In any story, whether it's a movie or a book that you might read, one of the more common story arcs is this idea of a hero's two journeys. And what it's built around is that the main character or the hero of the story has some outside goal or task that they're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And so the story follows them along as they try to accomplish it. And they may have obstacles that they have to overcome. And, you know, that creates part of the entertainment. Mm -hmm. But what makes the hero really compelling is a second journey. And that second journey is typically some kind of an internal transformation that they're going through. They're discovering uh, new things about themselves or new principles and values that now shift the way way they lead their life. And it just puts them in a better place. Um, So I like to refer to myself. I feel like I'm an example of that. And what I mean by that is, you know, from parenting six children, that the you know there's a lot of outside journey a lot of tasks and things to do i mean we had an endless uh, stream of homework to uh, take care of and places to be and meals to cook um you know and all those outside journeys and we you know, as with all good stories we had a lot of obstacles that we had to overcome as well um everything from a, you know a lost simply a lost homework assignment all the way to um, one of our child our kids had a little issue with a learning disability mm-hmm. um you know, as all parents know, you deal with little scrapes and bruises. You know, we dealt with that, but we also had one of our kids that had some issues with drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, we've all, you know, there's all these different obstacles that you have to overcome as well. So we, as you can imagine, dealt with all of that. And the interesting part though, is I was, you know, going through my journey as a, as a father of the six children, doing all the stuff that a father would do. I was also experiencing this in inter- internal transformation as well. And a lot of that was through my passion for, again, personal development, marriage and family, uh, family enrichment, really, and parenting. Um, And I was kind of discovering the principles and the values and beliefs that made our family work better. Mm -hmm. And when I say work better, you know, I, I actually, some 20 years ago or so now, I wrote this definition of a successful family. And it had to do with, you know, a successful family is one that, um, you know, they enjoy being together, they empower each other, they speak with respect. Um, not only do they enjoy the good times, but they also have this ability to deal with any difficult issues that come their way. Mm -hmm. And kind of the final part of my definition was there's just a sense of peace, joy, warmth, and love within the home. And so again, I was going through this internal transformation of discovering um, principal values and beliefs that help to make that possible. Um, and over the years, I mean, our family, you know, we don't always look like that and we don't always reflect that ideal, but we do more often than not, which is, you know, which is a good thing. And even more importantly, what I've found is that if we start to drift away, you know, something happens and sort of knocks us off our game a little bit, if you will, um, I now know how to bring us back. And so, 
you know, that's that internal transformation that I was going through. Um, and, and now where I find myself, our youngest child is now in college. And um, I don't, there's probably no better way to put it, but I just feel called to share these lessons that I've learned over the last four decades. And with that, I have, you know, founded the Family Enrichment Academy as being a vehicle to do that. And the book is a vehicle. I, you know, I've put together a book and, you know, those are vehicles for me to kind of fulfill that calling and share some of these lessons that I've learned over the years. So that's kind of a high level view of how I got to be in this place of wanting to share some of these insights and ideas with um, whoever needs some help. Yeah. And it's interesting the, the difference between like an academic, uh, which is, I mean, that's what I am as well, but the academic who shares book knowledge of how to do parenting or do life or do that versus I've been in the trenches and I've learned and there's some that have been in the trenches and they've only learned one way to do anything. So they're also not a very good example, but when you also then multiply that by six and then (laughs) grandkids and other, you start getting that. And again, you've made that kind of a area of study. I love that because it doesn't become just an end of one where I really can't understand your experience. You can probably relate to a lot of people in a lot of places that they're at. Yeah, because you have a a variety of different circumstances that have come up. And, you know, for me, you know, I over that time, I did a lot of classes and study what would be more considered academic and read tons of books. Mm -hmm. And so there was always that was there fueling it. But then I would go into the into the arena, if you will, and practice this within our family. And another reason why I like to use this idea of a hero's two journey Uh, two journeys is to really emphasize the fact that parenting is a journey and family enrichment is a journey. It's never ending. Um, You know, my kids, I have my oldest child is now, what is he, 36 years old. You know, he's got his own family, but I, it's amazing. I still parent him, if you will. I mean, it, it never stops. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that there's the circumstances that you face ongoingly change as well. I mean, the best example is, you know, you have your first child and when they're two years old, you deal with certain issues and concerns and fears. And, you know, it's certain things you deal with when they're two, but when they become five, now you get a whole new set of stuff of issues and circumstances. And then when they're eight, it's a whole new set. And it's just like, it's ongoing, this ever changing set of, you know, environment that you deal with. And that's why it's a journey. And so there's always, you know, room and opportunity for growth. And um, there's always the next thing that you're just, you know, that you're trying to deal with, which is why in, in my definition of a successful family, one of the fundamental components is being able to effectively deal with any difficult circumstances that come your way. Because that's 80% of it, because there's always going to be that next circumstance that you have to overcome. Yeah. And in the, the premarital stuff that I do, the prepare and rich that I use, mm-hmm. one of the graphs that I love is it shows the kind of an X and Y axis of, of flexibility and closeness, fa- family of origin, and then what it sounds like based off a few questions that you as a couple will be. That flexibility one is so critical because if you can't handle and you have things have to be a certain way. And when life changes and these different seasons come, you're not going to handle things very well. You're going to yeah. be rigid and, and trauma and difficult circumstances are actually going to rock you. You're not going to navigate those waters very well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, like I say, it's a journey and you get, and I think another piece of it is staying focused on what I'll call the real goal. I think sometimes we get distracted by, and it's that combination of that inside and outside journey. I mean, uh, take a high, you know, again, I work a lot with parents with teenagers, you know, the idea of the teen getting a certain grade in a course, that's an outside goal. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not accomplish that. And if you like, say, if you're real rigid, okay, that's the only that's the only objective. You may lose the opportunity for other personal growth. I sometimes the failure provides the best opportunity for growth and development, you know, and you don't want to discount that and, and miss that opportunity because you're so focused on the wrong, what I'll call the, uh, the secondary or the third priority from a goal standpoint. Um, and I think that happens a lot within marriages and families and parenting is we get a little distracted and we lose track of what's really the, you know, what's the primary goal here? So then that's a great question. Then, so what is the primary goal? Like, I'm sure this, 
if we asked a bunch of families, they would probably give us very different responses. Right. Right. Goal of raising their children. Yeah. And that's why you know, 20 years ago, I wrote that definition was the idea was, okay, what is the goal? What is it we're trying to accomplish? And I think ultimately it comes to that last line it, for me is the goal is how do you have a home that's full of peace, joy, warmth, and love. If you can do that as the goal, uh, everything else then tends to t- take care of itself. Um, and so that becomes the, for me, the, the North star, I'll give you an example. Um, if you if your home is really solid from that perspective and your children grow up in that home, that becomes their North star. And when that teenager goes out into the world and starts to meet other people, let's say they um, have a girlfriend or a boyfriend that pops up. If the home is full of peace, joy, warmth, and love, that's what they're going to be comparing that relationship to. And if that relationship doesn't feel the same and have those same attributes, they're going to recognize it as being, wait, something's not right here. Uh And they'll be able, and they will naturally have the ability to pull away from that. Whereas a lot of times I hear parents say, well, you know, I don't like my daughter's boyfriend. You know, what do I do? How can I get him away? And it's, and the lesson is that you want the, the child to be able to recognize that it's not good right. and let them make the decision to pull away because they start to understand and, and recognize what a good relationship looks like or what a loving relationship looks like. And so that's where you build that foundation in the home. Now they have that baseline to compare things to. And right. so that's an example of, you know, the problem, the quote unquote outside problem was I don't like the boyfriend. But the solution really comes back to that fundamental goal of how do I build a home that creates that base for them to, to, to operate from. And even though we do create that base, it doesn't mean all of our kids are going to launch and make perfectly wise. Absolutely. They right. have free will, which we would love to take away from them sometimes, yeah. <laughs> but they will have to make that journey. And some will actually really have to choose a harder journey. Right. Um, figure things out for themselves. They're not going to learn from others. They don't want to, they, they have their own individual um, kind of personality. But one of the things that Barna said in his research on parenting years ago, it's a book called revolutionary parenting. Um, and he studied 20 something year olds that were still on fire for God. And then he looked at the parents and he basically said, one of the, 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 I guess, goal of raising and launching the kids is that they have a, that they're champions for Christ. So when I launch my kid, it's not about going to college or getting married or some of the measuring sticks we lo- use for, for um, launching. It's more of where is their heart bent towards? Right. If they grew up in a home like you just mentioned. They're much more likely to have a heart bent towards other people, um, out, not measured by solely their, their medals hanging in the room or right. their grades. Which is another piece, and I, I didn't, you know, that goal, ultimately, if you think about all parents, their goal is they want their children to be happy and experience joy, right? That's really what it's about. And it, But they point to a lot of other goals. Well, if I can get them to college and they get a good job, the yeah. assumption is, well, if they get the good job and they're making money, then they will be happy yeah. and full of joy or feel a sense of purpose, but that you're kind of missing, you can accomplish that. That's where that, you know, having that taught in the home is okay. It's, it's really an internal thing. It's your perspective. It's, it's approaching the world from a love-based mindset or from a spiritual mindset. That's what's going to bring the happiness and joy. And so you teach that. And then whatever circumstance they deal with down the road, they still will be able to bring in that, um, that happiness and joy and purpose to it because it's more of an inside out kind of an approach. So then what, what have you heard from parents you've talked to that you've worked with and talked, kind of coached that where are they stuck? Where, what are the questions they're asking? Um, Cause it's probably very similar to some people listening. Right. Um, a lot of it, you know, there's a handful of sort of common questions, especially with teenagers. Uh, one of the most common ones is, you know, I want my teen to open up and talk more. Um, I feel like I'm disconnected. It's the one word answer. You know, they say, well, how was your day at school? And they say, fine. You know, they just feel like there's no engagement. And so that's, you know, a very common um, 
question, you know, how do I get my team to open up? Um, then, you know, the others that will pop up, a lot of it's around school, you know, and again, it's the parents saying, you know, how do I get my team to uh, try harder at school or to take a, uh, you know, do a better job with their homework, you know, that kind of stuff that they'll ask questions about. Um, I get some on like respect, you know, that, which is a lot of it's about listening, you know, that my team won't listen to me um, or they, um, I ask them to do something and they won't do it. There's a disagreement there. So, you know, you hear those kinds of questions as well. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of that. Um, and then obviously there's the big concerns, um, you know, worries about, you know, going out on Friday and Saturday night and just them making, you know, responsible choices as they're out in the world, you know, because again, as they, they grow, they get their wings a little bit and they go out and they're not around their parents as much. Um, Which is really so a lot of out who they really are. Yeah. And that's part of it. And, you know, and as a parent, we have to realize that that's part of their process is, um, you know, kind of discovering who they are. And, and actually, one of the things I like to encourage parents to um, a way of looking at it, this is sometimes and this is where a lot of the conflict and where I find people getting stuck. And hopefully this is the first place that we get them unstuck is um, there's stages to parenting. And when the child is younger, five, six, seven, eight years old, let's say, the parent kind of controls what goes on. If you think about, it. you know, they're in charge, they set the schedule, they decide, you know, they control what happens. But as that child goes through their preteen and into their teen years, there needs to be this transition where the teenager takes more control and responsibility for who they are and what they're doing. And the, the parent's role, I like to use the word empowerment, needs to shift to more of an empowerment approach. And one. that shift creates a lot of problems because the parent doesn't want to relinquish that control. You <laughs> so know, the they still actually want- actually oftentimes the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they want to maintain control and then the child doesn't do something the way they want them to or doesn't do something they feel like they should. And so then they start button heads. Right. And it's, it's really a, a matter of control. Yes. And, you know, and so shifting into more of an empowerment mindset, I like to encourage parents to think, okay, how do I empower my teen to be their absolute best? You know, how do I, you know, provide and support their development and growth? And it's, you talked about launching them. The, the real goal is to launch them. And part of that is you got to let go of that control and take that role of support or empowerment so that you can get them prepared to be able to launch. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's a struggle. And that's where I see a lot. Of, and if you think about it, you know, the parent that says, I want my child to respect me more. They don't listen to what I say. That's a control question. You know, there a lot of times they're trying to control and make the child do something Parents as opposed to seven versus the 15 year old that they are. So it's right. a relationship breakdown. Right. And the other piece and you kind of mentioned, too, is and this is a struggle for parents is to let the child fail a little bit, wow. because when they start to take on that you know, they start to spread their wings. We need to let them, um, you know, have an, they may fall and stumble a little bit. And again, your role is not to fix the problem. Your role is to help them develop the ability to overcome the problem. I heard a great way to put it is it's not about, you know, if you fix the problem, you solve it right then, but the better approach is to try to teach your team to be resourceful. If you can give them the ability to be resourceful, you've given them a lifetime skill, you right. know, and that's, and, and the only way you do that is by letting them fall and then coaching them through the process. Okay. How do you fix this? What do you do different next time? You know, you got to give them that, that chance to do that. And it's so, hard when we're so busy where it's easier to clean up the mess versus going, okay, I need to help you, even your four-year-old, clean up the mess and it takes three, four times longer. And if I had just cleaned it up, but they need to learn, you know, you made the mess, right. you clean it up. We were at a movie theater yesterday and after we stood up, my, one of my sons turned around and looked at all the trash at the people behind us, that they just left all this trash there. And he goes, look right. at that. And I was like, Yep. It's evidence of their parenting that they came from. Yeah. Like, you would never do that because I would never let you do that. 
Um, you clean up all your mess, you take it all out of the trash can as you leave and others are raised different. And so you see kind of how that home life, the culture of the home is carried into what's familiar in adulthood. Right. Exactly. It's, um, and it's, you know, their parenting, you know, and the other thing is that kids in, a, in that scenario, I can almost guarantee you kids model what their parents do. And so that parent probably is the one that leaves their stuff. Whereas if I'm the parent that I gather mine up, you know, if, especially a five or six year old, they see you doing it. They just say, okay, this is what we do. And they just do it then because it's not because you told them to, it's just because they're doing what um, they're modeling or following that example. And um, you know, in the teen years, something I'll bring up to people, you know, parents will be worried about their teenager uh, drinking and driving. And the question that's hard to ask is, well, how do you handle that? In other words, do you drink and drive? Yep. And you know, what is the example that you're setting? Because if you do it, you can guarantee that your, your teen's tolerance for that or their view of it will be um, more relaxed than what you might want it to be. So it's, it's, you know, sometimes we have to take a hard look at ourselves and what is it that, you know, what's the example that we're setting? <clears throat> and actually another piece of that is, you know, one of the best ways to build connection, if you think about people you have a strong connection with, a lot of times it's somebody who's vulnerable. You know, vulnerability is a way to really deepen connection. And sometimes parents will say, well, what do you mean with a teenager and how does that work? And I don't know if I want, well, being able to admit, let's say that in that example, you know, somebody that has had drinks and driven before, mm -hmm. you know, you go to the teen, you say, you know what, that really isn't right. And I don't do it. I have not done a good job of setting an example for you and in and, and being responsible when it comes to drinking and driving. And I'm going to try to do it. You're being vulnerable at that right. point. Yeah. And the teen will see that and they get a couple of things. One is they feel more connected to you because they feel like you kind of can relate to what they're doing. But the other thing is you're modeling the whole idea of personal growth and development too. Yes. And it sets that mind, you know, it's okay to make a mistake and that, you know, everybody, you know, it just, it creates a safe place for personal. So when the team then makes a mistake, they know that you're going to be more understanding of it and they'll be more willing to open up and talk about it. It just, it just creates that it's a, it's a circle that you can create by doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, just another example of how, you know, the stuff that we deal with modeling it, but then being vulnerable can be a big, a big help too. Yeah. You're definitely giving an example of being teachable versus a kid looks at right. who's perfect. And it's like, I can't be like that. So forget you think of the grades, the, the grades that we, we, we tend to define a kid by their grades. How, and the, the issue you mentioned earlier, if I, I'm not doing well in school because I don't really care no much there's no motivation from mom and dad to actually care it's either how do you get them to care how do you get them to want to care so that the grades change because that's then the measuring stick we're actually looking at the grade how do we make them care it's that personal sense of self and ownership but when all the weights on mom and dad why should they care about anything it's actually scary to think about when that parent tries to maintain control they are literally crippling their kids. Yeah, they are. And it's, um, you know, because in the, in the interesting thing is the entire, the whole idea of like entitlement. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you think you're doing them a favor. And, and it, I would throw out that the kid wants to blossom. You know, they're dying to blossom and to do and to come into their own. Yes. And it's almost like you're holding them back. Right. Um, you know, when the parent tries to accomplish, you know, do things and control and, and direct everything, you're holding them back and preventing them from blossoming into who they need to be as a person. And it and goes so on to it's, so many levels, like financially, if you are doing very well financially, your kid is not doing well financially. They don't have a job. That's right. you. Doing well. So for them to feel entitled for that brand new car at 16, no. Right. <laughs> if you right. can and want to, that's different, but it's also going to be valued different if they earn at least some of it. Right. Earn part of it. If they actually have some skin in the game and they learn to work for versus being served and never having to serve themselves. So the kind of children we raise, and that's also the switch from the di single digits to the double digits. 
in raising kids as parents, we must change, which is sounds right. like exactly and, where and you the, spend time with the parents on. Right. And it's, it starts with their mindset, you know, and right. making that, making that shift. Um, and yeah, so it, it's just, a, it, that's where a lot of the conflict comes in both good. And, and again, the, the child is being held back. A lot of times there's conflict between the parents and the child then. And it's interesting. The other thing I would point out is the, the issue that creates the conflict is typically not the core issue. So true. you know, there's something underneath <laughs> that's going on. Correct. And I would argue that 90, 80, 90% of that is around connection. And it's, it's that child feeling really connected <clears throat> to the parent and not feeling isolated or alone. Um, you know, when, when any of us really, when any of us start to feel isolated or alone um, or disconnected, it, it's really a tough place to be. And that comes out in a lot of different ways. Some people, they get angry and fight about everything. Other people get apathetic. You know, right. you talked about the kid that doesn't care about their grade. That apathy, in my mind, is a sign that they feel disconnected. And one of the ways they feel this, we talked about the parent controlling everything. That to the child, it feels like they're disconnected because they're not being heard. Right. They're not, there's no, they're not being valued. And so they feel like they're just isolated over here all by themselves, even though every, all of their needs are being cared for. Yep. It's still, they don't feel connected to anything and how it comes out is apathy for some, you know, it's like, I don't care. And I don't, you know, why should I care? Nobody cares kind of a thing. So um, it's that's interesting. It's, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, that's why the word that I use a lot with parents in terms of the relationship with your teen, as they're, as they're growing up and you really are moving towards launching, but you're also moving that way when they're younger too. The goal is right. that, they, that they're a functional adult but it's, you're negotiating with them. If it's my way or the highway versus, Hey, what ideas do you have? Oh, that's not, you don't like my idea. You come up with an idea and it's negotiated all the way from internet to what TV shows you watch to smartphones, to all these issues. You know, should I go out on a Friday night? What's my curfew? We all have an opinion about all of those things, all things. But if you negotiate with them, they got they have skin in the game when they right. know their consequences they have skin in the game if you follow through and as soon as you don't follow through then that's another whole story but right and it's it's it the other thing even if you don't utilize their idea or strategy at least they feel heard Correct. you know what i'm saying they were able to contribute to the conversation um the other thing and again I, the book's focused and a lot of my practice is focused around teens but let's take it back to um younger kids you know mm-hmm. two three four five year olds obviously i've been around a lot of them i got a lot of grandkids that age now <laughs> yeah and really it's about you know giving them I, th- I i like to encourage parents to think about giving choices that are age appropriate and you can start that all the way back to when they're two or three years old. Um, you know, with a three-year-old, you ask them, do you want the green cup or the blue cup? And that's an empower, you know, you're starting to train them to make their own decision and that their voice matters. That's the other thing you're communicating to them is that they matter at that point and that they're an important part of the family and they're, you know, they have a, uh, they are heard when they have a request. So you start to and it's just about being age appropriate. You know, the, the third grader, you know, would you prefer to do your homework before or after your snack when you get home from school? You, know, you start throwing this stuff. And then, yep. and then when they're in seventh grade, it's not before or after the snack. It's just when do you plan on doing your homework? Mm-hmm. You start to turn over that control and that responsibility. And when they're in high school, you may never even ask that question. Because it's their responsibility at that point. It's just sort of a a part of the way that relationship has evolved. And you, again, continue to give more and more um, authority, if you will, or control. You widen the the, the funnel, if you will. And but it, you some, can start. For some, we have to narrow it back down. For some, we right. have to, okay, you've not owned up to your part. So, right. We'll have to, we have to come back and narrow the field a little bit and limit but the choices. Some. It's not a game. So yeah, either we we're doing it in relationship with our kids and our teens not like we're trying to sneakily try to get them to then obey us or trick them so i think that's important too 
which, you know, another one, again, I, I like to really encourage parents and talk a lot about building connection. Mm -hmm. And like one that. of the primary reasons you want to build that connection is because then you have a much better sense of how prepared your teenager is. You know, are they, you know, where are they at? And, and to be quite, we've had six kids. Um, there's a few of our kids at age 15 had the maturity of an 18 year old. You know what I'm saying? And then we had other ones that at 18 were maybe still at 16 or, 15, you know, because they're all different. As you mentioned, everybody matures different. But the stronger that connection is, it gives you some insight as to where they are and what's appropriate, you know, where, you know, how, how do you open up those choices to them um, and what would be appropriate for them and what can they handle? Um, actually, one of the things and I've talked about in the book is this, I, I call it the perceived readiness gap. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is the teenager is always going to overestimate their ability to handle and deal with situations. Okay. And, but the parent is always going to underestimate the teen's ability. And so you have this gap in the middle, which is, you know, from a perspective standpoint, one's over, one's under. And it's a matter of how do you bridge that gap and start to close in. And again, that's where connection is such a big part of that, because the more connected I am to the team, yeah. the better just intuitively, you know, moms and women are much better at, at listening to and understanding their intuition and just picking up on those signals. But dads can do it, too. But you just got to build that connection so that and then you got to start to trust your intuition and be able to, you know, if you have some sense of where they are, you can help let that guide you a little bit on, OK, he's ready for this or my daughter's ready for this. Um, and then let them, you know, have that, and then it's that a opportunity. And then it's a risk right. every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's but a scary part. That's when it leads us back to wanting to control it again. <laughs> right. The fear starts to come back in, yep. you know, because you're afraid of the potential consequence. But again, that's that's how we learn. It's, I just um, heard you, just a little bit ago, maybe even the recording heard a motor start. My son just drove away. He's 16 and <laughs> an old 1993 Jeep Grand Cherokee with no muffler and um, subwoofer and all his fun little stuff. But as he drives away, it's that thought in your head of his safety yep. and he has bald tires now and <laughs> right. uh, all these things and, um, and it's rainy. So um, that's doesn't go away when you're actually your kid's 30. Uh, absolutely not. There's just different. It's just different stuff. Exactly. That's what happens. And actually what you're describing is a great lead into another thing I'd like to talk to parents about is this idea of um, the heat of the moment or, you know, because, you know, we have, I like to say we have these two competing mindsets within us and we all have them. And one of them um, is, is love based and one of them is fear based. And you know, when we're sitting here relaxed, talking like this, it's easy for me to stay more grounded in love um, and be more compassionate and understanding all that sort of thing. So true. But what happens is life will put the squeeze on you. Something happens. And when it happens, it pulls you into that fear based mindset. And so part of the process is self-awareness and being able to recognize when life's putting the squeeze on whatever it is um, and, and being able to catch yourself in the moment, creating a little bit of a pause and then regrouping, if you will, or re and shifting um, back into more of a love-based mindset. Um, and actually that's part of the role a parent can play for the teen because the teen's going to have things happen too. You know, they come home and, you know, something happens at school you know, one of their friends or whatever, and all of a sudden, boom, they're in a bad place, they're frustrated, whatever, the parent can be that, it's sort of like a safe place for that emotion to be released and, and, and you know, and, and, and let it dissipate yeah. so that the teen can then get into a better place again. So and that's the differences in parenting, some parents squelch it, no feelings he allowed here, right. which creates the problems we see and, you know, late adolescence and you know, young adulthood versus also that freedom where there are no reins, there are no boundaries. So it's like where, how to, how to guide with how you handle emotions, how you handle disappointment, how you handle rejection. What you said earlier, we've got to let them fail and think about failing within the boundaries of a, uh, of a ping pong table versus, you know, the Serengeti, like, wide open so once they leave our our house their failures are going to be very different right want them to fail actually under our roof 
in certain areas in certain ways. Right. It's, That's hard to yeah. curate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and again, it's every child's different. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes parenting a, a challenge, you know, in a journey because, you know, you deal with it differently. And the other thing I just encourage people to, to realize and be understanding for themselves is you're not going to get it, quote unquote, right all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's OK. It's all part of your journey. And so you got to learn to forgive yourself, be grateful for where you are and say, okay, how do I do different or better next time? Or how can I grow and learn from this situation? And it's, it's actually, you think back to the young parent, you know, when that parent has their first child, yep. which we've been watching it again with our kids, yes. you know, how protective and, you know, everything's got to be just so, but by the time the third or fourth one rolls, rolls around, <laughs> it's like, you know, you're a different person because right. you've experienced and grown and developed and it, that's always the case. And so, um, you know, adopting that growth mindset for yourself as a parent and, and being okay with, well, maybe I didn't handle that situation the best, but say, you know, I try and, it, you know, and see if we can work and develop and be better next time. And that's just part of it. And you have to be open to that and be, allow yourself to, to experience that. Yeah. Dan Allender, I love the way he talks about in the parenting um, stuff that he's, that he talks about the, the way that we as parents think that we're supposed to have it all together, that we think we're supposed to be perfect. That we have all these just impossible. When I admit that I will fail 100% of us will, that I will fail my kids. It's like this weight gets lifted off our shoulders and I can actually have permission to, to do, do life and right. fail and get back up. And all those pieces, as you mentioned in the beginning, all those pieces teach our kids. It teaches, it creates a culture, right? You're creating a culture of, of constriction and you can't, it's all has to be perfect or one of it's okay to fail here. And I got your back and I'm always going to love you no matter what you do. We need to really intentionally curate as moms and dads, what that looks like in our home. And we may need to do some change, make some changes on that. Right. Um, right. All and of there's it. absolutely, you know, essentially you mentioned being intentional. And again, that's part of my message is you got to take it on and be intentional. And there are some things I'll just give a couple of that I, I've listed in the book, just simple things that about being intentional. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's about mindset because, you know, it's easy to get pulled into that fearful mindset. Uh, one example is the, the idea of transitions and being intentional about your transitions. Um what I mean by that is, let's say your teenage son walks in the house every day at 3.30 home from school. When they come in, that's a transition. You know, it's, it's a point where you're going to re-engage with them. And the, the intentionality of it is at, if they get home at 3.30, at 3.15, you stop for a minute. You say, okay, what is my intention for the first 15 minutes when they walk in the house? You know, I want to be present. I want to be compassionate. I want to be, uh, you know, available to them if they want to talk about something. So you sort of set that intention. Yes, I love that. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and then you know, but you have to be mindful of it because if you just if you just walk in and you're in the middle of filling with your phone, answering an email, then all of a sudden you miss that opportunity to to be intentional. Another example is let's say they um, they go to a soccer practice. And you're picking them up in the car again, when they get in the car and that car ride home, that's a transition and you can be intentional about that. How do you want that? You know, how do you want that next 15 minutes to go? Um, And how can, and then the other piece of it is um, you say to yourself, what do I have to be mindful of that could happen that could pull me into a fearful mindset? Mm -hmm. And again, prepare yourself for that squeeze Mm-hmm. And hopefully that helps create some awareness. So if it starts to happen, you can catch, oh, okay. And then you can redirect and be, but you got to go into it with some intention at that point. So I like to encourage people to think about those transitions because this can be great opportunities wow. to connect and build relationship, you know, with, especially with a teenager. Um, and another one is the simple one I like to share with people is um, we all have phones and all of those phones have alarms on them. Mm-hmm. And some people don't realize you can set an alarm and you can add some text to it. And what I'll do and encourage people to do is let's say somebody, you know, I want to really work on being more compassionate. 
So you set an alarm for 10 a.m. and it goes off every day at 10 a.m. And it, it on the text, it says, mm -hmm. how can I be more compassionate today? And it's just that reminder that keeps it in front of you because otherwise it drifts off. You know, you can have that thought, but it'll sort of drift off. And in the busyness of your day, you lose it. Um, so those are examples of being intentional about my personal growth and trying to stay grounded in some of these, these love-based ideas. So um, there, there's all kinds of, and I'm sure there's a million other ways to do it, but that's just when they get harder. Things. Like I love the time. I didn't do it as much as my wife did in terms of in the car with our kids going to things but when our oldest who's 16 started driving, it's like, whoa, we just lost that car time, that transition. Right. So right. you've got to start pivoting. How do you recreate that when now you don't have that alone time? Right. And at every little stage or when there's other kids in the car, it's different. And you just right. that uh, that you've got to be intentional about creating these moments, these times, these spaces. I think back at my dad and go, wow he seemed always to be available. It's right. like he had nothing to do, which I know that's not true. He said, <laughs> wait on me to call even after I'm off in college. Right. Every time I called, it seemed like he was always available to talk. Right. Kind of neat to think of that. Not, I know not every job allows for that, but right. to, to, he created an environment that I knew I could always rely on him. Right. It helped me through some really difficult times. Which, and you think about that made you feel connected. And you always felt heard. And yeah. that just creates that foundation then for you to go off and do other stuff. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's so critical to have that. So probably and, and, and as you said, you know, well, everybody's circumstance. Right. Yeah. I was gonna say everybody's circumstance is different. And, you know, somebody may not be able to be that way with the phone, but you can look for and find what works within your structure to yeah. where you can have those moments to uh, create that connection is key. Um, and that's why I like to tell people, sometimes I say, well, what do I do? And for me, it's, and it's not so much about what, because everybody's circumstance is different. It's who are you being in that moment and how are you, you know, who, where are you from a mindset standpoint? If you're in a good place, the, the stuff will come up. You'll sort out what I can do, but you got to start by being in the right place because then you see the options that are out there in front of you. Yeah. I heard a mom recently tell, tell me, She's like, I wish I had not listened to the moms around me when our kids were little and, and just they kept saying, just enjoy this age, just enjoy the kids because I enjoyed them, but I wasn't intentional. And now I have teenagers and I realized I missed out on the most critical developmental stages of, of strengthening my kids. And I think that's an important lesson. Like I hadn't thought of it that way is that because of the message she was receiving from friends. She kind of just let her guard down and just kind of let things happen. And so then it creates a culture where it really is almost where a culture where the kids are in charge, not the parents. Right, right. But and what I would add to that, because you may have some people out there listening who now have teenagers and they feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's never it's never too late. Um, you can turn things around. Absolutely. And you just got to start where you are and start working forward. What and are some so tips do you have? What are some tips that you um, use? When, when you have a kid that's that you're stuck with and how do you turn that in that tide? How do you change that when you have a teenager? And yeah, it kind of my, my three fundamentals are just fundamentals. And the first one starts with the parent and it's this whole idea of mindset and, and just staying grounded. You have to stay grounded in that love-based mindset. So that's number one. And once you're there, the second fundamental is to build connection. Um, again, using the old 80-20 rule, I would argue that 80% of the issues and struggles are because the teen or whatever, they feel disconnected. And if you can build connection and, and reestablish that, they want, I mean, whether they say it or not, all children desperately crave the connection of their parents. Yep. And so if you can create that connection, you're going to solve a lot. And actually, um, one of the things I will throw out to parents is I, I encourage them to think of any bad or unwanted behavior. It's really a call to connect. It's your child crying out and asking you to, uh, to connect with them and to engage with them from a love, a love based perspective. Um, and again, the, the bad behavior is just a symptom of that deeper need that they need to connect. So 
And that's always the, the second fundamental is, is find ways to connect. And that solves a lot of problems. Yeah. And then the, the third piece of it, especially with a teenager, is the idea of empowerment. And even with a, a difficult or a teen that struggled, if you can find a way to start to empower them, in other words, help them to come into their own and help them to start to feel like they have um, some a purpose and direction and that they matter, um, as they feel that, they become more pleasant and more, you know, they become more <laughs> joyful and more happy because everybody does. I mean, it's just a function of, of who we are. I mean, we want to feel that way. What was that first so connection and empowerment? What was the first one? Is the parents staying oh. grounded themselves. Mindset. And yeah. Then they, yeah, yeah. As, and and they, they sort of build on each other. If, if a parent is not grounded in yep. <laughs> from a love-based perspective, they will not be able to build connection. I mean, if I'm, if I'm fear-based, angry, frustrated, I will, you know, all I can do is damage the connection. Yeah. And the only way to heal and, and to move forward is to be, I got to first be grounded. So that becomes a prerequisite for building the connection. But then the next piece is building connection is a prerequisite for the empowerment stage, totally. because I can't hope to empower or influence the team if I don't have a strong connection. Um, so they, they build on each other. And so you got to walk through those steps, start with yourself, mm -hmm. make sure you're in a good place, then move to connection. Once you start to feel that connection, start to develop, then move to empowerment. Love um, that. and if you go through those steps, um, and there's different skills and strategies that you can use along the way, but those are kind of the fundamental steps that you can take and you can rebuild that relationship and really transform the way, um, things are going for that team. Well, that's the work you do. It's the work that I do as well. It's the idea right. of walking alongside a parent, one or both, helping them understand the fundamentals, as you said, and then, this, then with each individual person, the strategies. So how's this going to work for you in your right. context and in your family setting, your family situation? Um, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I love that. So, so, so helpful, so practical. I love that. Yeah, it's um, and, it, and it works. I mean, we, you know, if you can really start to do this, you can. All, that's why I say there's always hope. You can move people yes. forward <laughs> and, and they can make, you know, tomorrow can be better than today. And the first piece of it is hope. Hope is very powerful, you know, and if somebody and I'm sure you've had um, people that you've worked with where they come in and you sense there's some hopelessness there. Oh, and um so and you, you know, you just got to start to say, okay, there is some hope here. And again, that starts with the parent, right. you know, starting to feel hopeful as well, which is more of an internal um, mindset, you know, convert. That's where you got to start. So, and so you created the Family Enrich Acad Enrichment Academy. So, familyenrichmentacademy.com. That's your website. And, yep. and your, what you have for people that are listening is go there, familyenrichmentacademy.com, and you can actually opt in for the, um, 10 questions to never ask um, because they are conversation yeah. pillars. Yeah. As I mentioned, you asked me, you know, what are some of the things that I hear? One of the most common ones, how do I get my team to open up and talk more? Or how do I develop that? And what I like to say to them, well, one of the best things you can do is ask better questions. Ask better questions. You know, if you ask better questions, that's going to provide that space for them to open up and talk more. And so I, the, I learned that asking my kid, how was it? I'm going to get the one word answer. Fine. Right. Right. Exactly. You <laughs> got to engage them. Matters. <laughs> yeah, it does matter. And so the, the resource that I have, and it's a free resource for people is 10 questions to never ask your team. And the idea is these are conversation killers. They're the ones that are going to get you the one word answers. And then I also have 10 great questions. These are the conversation starters. So again, on the website, you can go there. It's a free resource right at the top of the homepage. Um, you know, and just, then also on your website, on the website, I, I just filled it out and clicked on it and you, it links to then buy on Amazon, your book, how to be the parent, your teenager needs you to be without yep. fighting frustration or fear of doing it wrong. There you go. So that's, that's the, the book and love to have people buy it and check it out. And then I'll add, you know, part of the other piece of this is, you know, I coach and work with, with clients as well. And, um, I have a 28 day parenting boot camp. Is what I called it. It's it's the it works. 
it's over a four week period and it's really works through those fundamentals of the what that you'll find in the book and the, the premise is to you know learn a little bit try it you know put it in the practice in the week and then we come back so it's like five different coaching calls and then exercises and, and chances to put things into practice in the in-between time so um, but again it's all kind of built around the ideas in the book as well wonderful love it love it love meeting someone who loves families and empowering parents and encouraging parents you can do this our world needs parents to step up absolutely uh, so much has failed there we've in our models of parenting of just kind of free range chickens we've got some serious problems on our hand in our world we need parents to step up to lead but it's not leadership like a dictator it's leadership in a conversation relationship depth connection right Intimacy. Okay, well, and to wrap it up, I'll circle back to my idea of a hero's two journeys. Yes. I mean, the parenting, you're going through this process with your child, but it's really a huge gift for yourself. And if you can learn and grow and develop as a person, you will find more peace, joy, happiness, purpose, and all that in your life as well. And that's that internal transformation that you, you can go through. So it's, it's good for the kids, but it's also a, a gift for the parent as well. Yes trying to maintain or hang on to control is like to like trying to pull back a, a wild horse. It's like when I let go, there's a, the course tends to calm down. Like I, the way that I live my life is very different and there can be a piece that, that does pass all understanding. Yeah. I think a lot of parents don't believe that's possible or it's just, yeah. it'll never end. Especially when you think of the baby stages, some of those stages feel like it'll never yeah. end. Yeah, and I'll like never it, uh, sleep again either. And never sleep again. <laughs> you will. Um, yeah. But in that, one of the things that's my heart is your marriage relationship needs to be one of the most solid pieces of that bigger puzzle is to, to stay connected to your spouse. You're a team. You're different people. You're meant to be different. Right. So you're not equipped the same, but to be a team as a couple and protect your marriage because a lot of kids end up through their struggles, the parents split apart or move apart because right. they handle it different. And so how to find someone like you that actually will help the, the couple, you know, maintain focus, deal with the internal stuff that leads to change is so, so necessary in our world. Yep, absolutely. And it's, you know, that marriage relationship is a model or an example for the child as well. Yeah. And if you can work and develop your ability to be in a relationship, they take, they watch and they see and they mob, then they can go out into the world and have a meaningful relationship as well. Mm -hmm. So that's just another way that we sort of set the example for them. So true. Well, Jim, great talking to you today. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and share some thoughts and, and some, um, you know, some of my information. If, um, you know, it's just an honor to be able to help and serve people as they, as they move through their journey. Yeah. So go to familyenrichmentacademy.com and check out that freebie and link to the book and the coaching and courses that uh, Jim White has to offer. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tuning in to the Family Features Podcast. It has been an honor to serve. Find out more about Dr. Gilbert and his resources for you and your family's growth and success at HealingLives.com. And if you think you could use some support along the way, be sure to book that call at BookDrG.com. And one more thing, if you found this helpful, please share this podcast with others so that we can change the world together.